Hello everyone, I'm Brian Weigel, and in this video, we will be reviewing Renfro and Vaughn's chapter eight, what were they like in the text, Archaeology Essentials. This is a review of bioarchaeology. Our principal aim in this video is to describe how in archaeology, through the physical evidence, we can reconstruct attributes of past individuals and populations or groups. So through human remains, we can understand um, quite a lot about a person's life. And if there are multiple examples of, of human remains, say from a cemetery, we can reconstruct quite a lot about the population from which these people lived and their relationship to one another. So bioarchaeology is the study of human remains from archaeological sites and archaeological contexts. One fundamental question is that archaeologists ask, or, or that archaeologists are often asked, or how do archaeologists no human remains are going to be present in a site. And the answer is we don't always know that, um, but when they are found, um, it's quite obvious. Typically it's in the form of skeletal remains, but sometimes casts of humans. So for example, the Pompeii bog bodies here in these images where um, people are actually buried in, um, well, in this case, pyroclastic flow, which um, outline their bodies and preserve them um, in the form of a cast. And here you can see the detail at Pompeii. There's a human, but also this dog, a domestic dog with its collar intact in its last throes of life um, from the volcanic eruption that buried the, the village. Um, other times it's more obvious in that just skeletons are found, um, the, the bones that remains, most often teeth, uh, because the anim, uh, enamel coating helps teeth preserve longer, they're harder, and they're encased in that enamel, so they tend to last longer. Um, other parts of the skeleton um, dissolve um, more quickly than, than others, but often we'll have a complete skeleton. Sometimes we have um, the flesh, too, the organic flesh uh, on the body, and we'll talk about some examples where unique preservation conditions can result in um, the full preservation of, of human remains going back thousands of years. Um, sometimes it's difficult, though. Um, oftentimes, none of the bones are preserved. Uh, you might find human hair, um, and increasingly through ancient DNA and environmental DNA, you might be able to extract evidence of physical human uh, remains in the form of simply DNA from the soil or other parts of the site. So another question we wanna ask in this video is what can we learn from human remains? We can identify the individual's sex sometimes, uh, not always, depends on the age at death of the individual, but that can also be um, determined with some accuracy. We can learn about the individual's build, um, uh, whether they are muscular or slight. Uh, and in some cases we can learn about their occupation or if they had been doing repetitive tasks um, like uh, washing laundry or milling grain, or perhaps they were an archer. Um, repetitive tasks um, can leave traces on the skeleton themselves. Um, in many cases, we can learn about their appearance, uh, their physical appearance, what they actually looked like through facial reconstruction and other means. We'll talk some about that. And their relationships to one another, both um, genetically and socially in many cases. Um, social status, social position um, can be determined through the context in which um, some of the remains have been um, found. And we'll, we'll talk about some examples of these. Another one not listed here is paleopathology. We can determine in some cases uh, disease from the skeleton. Not all diseases because many affect the soft tissue, but some diseases leave an impression on on the skeleton um, and malnourishment also, um, the degree to which uh, the people were healthy in general can be determined from the skeletons. So as we know, pirates would say that dead men tell no tales, but um, there's an exception for that 
uh, in, in many cases, if we have the physical remains of the individual, they actually do tell quite a few tales. And in many cases, they may tell the cause of death. So in this case, we'll look first at Lindau Man, a body that was found in the bog in Northwest England. In 1984, peat miners found Lindau Man in the peat bog. They were cutting peat. Um, to burn. Peat is an accumulation of organic matter, grasses, and typically in bogs or wet environments. Um, but if you cut that peat and dry it out, it's essentially carbon and it can burn uh, much like wood or coal. And so um, in Northwest England and other parts of Northern Europe for centuries, people have har harvested peat as a fuel source. And they do occasionally find things in that peat and sometimes it's human remains. The unique characteristic of the acidic nature and the anaerobic environment um, in these peat bogs make the preservation of soft tissue exceptional in many cases. So Lindown Man was found. Uh, he is in. He was in his mid twenties. He was well built, about 132 pounds, five foot six to five foot eight inches tall, which was. Um, a solid individual um, for that time might be a little small for uh, males in the present era, but in the first century AD, the late Iron Age of the Roman period, this was um, a well-built individual. His appearance was um, nice. He had a sheared, trimmed beard. He had some sideburns and a mustache. All this indicated that uh, he was male. The reason we go by the facial hair is that uh, only the upper torso uh, of the individual was found. He was uh, severed in half either through the mining activities or, or for some other reason, the, the lower part of the body was missing. From what we can learn from Lindown Man, we know that his nails were fairly well manicured. He had manicured fingernails indicating that he wasn't really a physical laborer. He didn't, he didn't work with his hands in, in the sense of um, a laborious activity. That doesn't mean we know uh, what he did for an occupation, though, or which part of the social hierarchy he came from. We just know that he wasn't a physical laborer. His last meal was a form of griddle cake, sort of like a pancake. Um, and in terms of his overall health, the bog acids remove and um, erode the enamel from the teeth, but we, the pulps were remaining. We could see that he had no cavities. Um, there was some slight osteoarthritis, uh, compressed vertebrae in the back. There were some parasites, eggs that suggested high infestation of whipworm and mawworm. This is not unusual for the Iron Age at all. So overall, his health was um, fairly good at the time of death. Cause of death included a fractured head from behind. He was hit in the back of the head and um, struck twice by a narrow bladed object, maybe a sword or a dull sword or a club or something. Plus there was a blow um, from a knee to the back, which fractured a rib. So may have been whacked on the head where he fell to his knees and then um, kicked with a knee into his back. Um, the head blow probably knocked him unconscious so that he wasn't really aware uh, when another blade slit his throat, severing his jugular vein. Then a knotted sling that was about one and a half millimeters thick was found wrapped around his neck and he, and he was strangled prior to being hung and snapping his vertebrae. So somebody really wanted this guy dead. And finally, after he was bled out and hung and, and, um, bonked on the head, he was dropped face down in a shallow bog and left there to, to die, and he became deposited within the bog itself. So um, this was a fairly aggressive uh, murder, sacrifice, we don't really know. Uh, so just as an introduction to the rest of this, uh, those bog bodies are fairly uh, rare. We do find them occasionally. We'll talk more about some bog bodies uh, later in this video, uh, but we want to discuss three different factors related to the variety of different human remains and what we can learn about them in terms of identifying their physical 
attributes. So for the rest of this video, we'll talk first about identifying the sex of the individual, male or female. Secondly, we'll talk about how long they lived um, at age of death. Uh, and third, we'll talk about how they were related to one another sort of as a group or a population um, scale information um, gathering. So for number one, um, sex, which sex is the human remains that were discovered, identifying biological sex from human remains. And in your textbook, Renfro and Vaughn, um, there's this excellent chart which shows um, the differences between male on the left and female on the right. And in general, there is, of course, some overlap within our species between you may get a female that is larger and more robust than some males. So um, just keep in mind that there is an in-between zone here, but in general, males will have larger skull, larger, more prominent brow ridge. The jaw tends to be larger. Um, the pelvis is narrower with a higher arc uh, on the male. Uh, Pelvis is the most diagnostic attribute of sex. And in the female, the pelvis is wider and has a larger cavity for um, the birth canal. Rib cage tends to be a bit shorter. And there is some differences in circumferences of the tibias at the lower leg bone. So these types of attributes can be used to help determine if the human remains that you have uh, discovered are male or female. So number one, the shape of the pelvis, its relative size, um, and uh, male bones tend to be bigger, longer, more robust, and more developed muscular attachments um, on the, um, say, the epicondyles and the tubercles where muscles attach to the bones um, tend to be larger in males than they are in females. Children present a problem in identifying sex. In fact, you cannot reliably determine if a uh, pre-adolescent child is male or female. Teeth can provide a little bit of evidence to this in terms of the timing of their eruption sequences in the jaw, but the best guess is 50-50 as to whether or not um, a child is male or female. And the reason is they just haven't developed those um, characteristics that present as adults. So we'll look at some cases of where that presents some problems. Um, Subadult or children um, have underdeveloped um, skulls. These specimens lack diagnostic traits. Bones are still fairly pliable as children, even for months after they're born. And in some cases, in some cultures, this is used in some rather bizarre cranial modification features where as a child, you can place two planks or boards around the infant's head and gently wind a cloth around it, tightening it, much like an orthodontist would use braces to straighten your teeth um, as an adolescent. Uh, the skull can be morphed uh, into a different shape. Now, this is permanent, so you cannot reverse this trend. As an adult, you would have a cone head, like in this case from the Andy the Andes Mountains in South America, where cranial modification was a sign of social status. How long did individuals live? Um, you know, for the, the primary uh, estimate, you can say that, this, that the human uh, with the remains in which you're dealing was young, was an adult, or was old. That's fairly easy to determine um, on human remains. Now, if you want to get more specific, we can look at epiphyses because these fuse at different times uh, in, in stages of life. And so if you have a complete skeleton, you can look at the different epiphyses on the long bones and determine uh, within a couple of years the age at death. The same is true of the skull. You have di different plates in the skull, and these fuse at different um, times or different ages. So here's another uh, chart that's from your textbook, and it shows down the left column the age at which, um, or the age range at which some epiphyseal plates fuse. And by combining all of these, you can see some have narrower ranges and than, than do others, 
And in some cases, it's a, a eight year range. Um, so it's, it's not super precise, but if you have the complete skeleton, then you can get within a few years of the age at death by um, estimating and comparing these epiphyseal plates. Tooth eruption sequences are um, more reliable. Uh, you can get down to the month level if you're dealing with uh, a subadult, and uh, you can see here that you know the teeth come out, come emerge from the jaw at different times between eight to twelve months. Um, you start to get your central incisors, um, canines from sixteen to twenty-two months of of age, and then the molars start to appear between. Uh, 25 and 33 uh, months. Uh, there are uh, the third molars or what's known as the wisdom tooth that emerges between 17 and 21 years. So if you're talking about your permanent teeth, um, there are age ranges there too. So teeth are extremely informative and useful for determining how old the individual was. You can actually learn even more from teeth if you look at a cross section of them the tooth growth ridges within the teeth can give you a uh, fairly good estimation on an annual basis how old the individual is, as well as quite a lot of information about nutrition and health. To some degree, tooth wear is useful um, in determining age. Uh, it works well for a modern individual. If it's a forensic case, the degree of wear on teeth can estimate uh, the individual's age. Now, if you're grinding your teeth or you're using them as tools or otherwise, then you will wear them down more rapidly. Also, diet has something uh, to do with that. But here is a case from prehistory where teeth are worn well down into the pulp cavities. It must have been very painful. Um, and it's more difficult to determine age from wear patterns uh, from pre prehistoric times, especially if they're um, engaged in um, grinding of flour from corn or, or barley or wheat because the stone will get in, the grit from the stone will get into the um, food and that kind of acts as sandpaper on the teeth. Um, in other cases, teeth are used routinely as tools to gnaw leather, in many cases um, to soften it, and that wears the teeth down more rapidly as well. So there's not a direct correlation between activities from the past and modern activities where we tend not to chew leather on a daily basis in the modern era. So to summarize in determining age at death, um, there is a time scale for age at death from um, dental information, which is extremely useful. It works very well in modern people, despite there is some variation depending on behaviors and activities, but it's not necessarily as true for, for our distant ancestors in terms of determining age. We can talk more about activities. And one example from a non-modern Homo sapiens, here is a Neanderthal child, the Teshik Task, Tash child burial, um, which was once thought to be a hybrid between modern humans and Neanderthals because of the phenotypic expression of the skull here. It, was diff it has some Neanderthal traits, it has some modern human traits. For example, you can see how large the teeth and molars are. You can see how large the uh, nose uh, orbit is, uh, which it doesn't have much of a brow ridge. So these are a combination of what looks like modern human, what looks like Neander Neanderthal, but the problem is it's sub-adult. And so it retains neotenous traits of being a child. And so the question was, was it Neanderthal or was it modern? Uh, the species designation was disputed for decades. A long time it was thought to be a hybrid child between the two, which we know is a possibility, but recent DNA confirmed that this is a Neanderthal and just illustrates the fact that subadults have neotenous traits or infantile traits. They're not fully developed and it can make identifying the sex of the individual difficult, but in this case, it made identifying the species of the individual difficult as well. So it's not always possible to gauge biological sex from a subadult. May even be difficult to identify what species they come from. And in part, this is because of underdeveloped postcranial skeletal features on the individual. Um, you know, a child Neanderthal below the skull looks an awful lot like a modern human child below the skull as well. Although um, the 
you would think that the bones would be thicker, larger diameter, more robust. Um, some of those traits really emerge uh, more pronounced as adults. By looking at the bone microstructure, you can tell the age of an individual. With age, the bone architecture at the cellular level actually changes quite a bit. A young adult has rings around the circumference of the long bones, these sort of um, osteons. Um, and the young adult will have a small number of osteons. And with age, the rings kind of fade and disappear and you get more and more osteons, this kind of bone cell structure. This is accurate within about five years in modern samples. Um, so the degree to which it applies in prehistory is probably fairly similar, but uh, I, I don't know that we know that for certain. Now, part three, what did they look like? Unique circumstances that may result in exceptional preservation so that we can actually see the physical uh, remains and we can look at the face of some of these individuals. And we'll just talk about some examples, we've already mentioned the bog bodies, but here's another bog body, the excellent preservation of Talund Man in Northern Denmark. This is a bog body buried in, buried in peat. Um, you can see the stubble on his face, you can see his eyelashes, his hair, He's still wearing his cap. The wrinkles around his forehead are perfectly preserved, even though this individual died during the Iron Age, the fourth century Iron Age, the Roman period of Northern Europe. He was also found as workers were harvesting peat in the, but this one in 1950. He was ritual. It was a ritual killing, um, and it suggests some reverence for water, which we know that Celtic tribes in Central Europe had reverences for ponds and um, for trees in specific locations. Uh, but this ritual killing um, seemed to be a sacrifice of the individual although to some degree that's conjecture. Talun man was killed by a slow strangling hanging. It did not break the vertebra in the neck. So it was suffocated by this cord around his neck that he was hung by. And he was ritually placed in the bog in a sleeping position. Somebody closed his eyes and closed his mouth and put him in this sort of fetal position. And this suggests that it was a sacrifice. He later then sunk into the bog and became buried. You can see how he's kind of compressed a bit by the weight of the peat. Uh, interesting that the hands did not, the, the soft tissue on the hands and forearms did not last as long or preserve as well, but the rest of the body is intact, including organs. And look how well his feet are preserved. It's like, um, you know, this is not a couple thousand years old. Um, his hat is still on. The cord is still tied. You can see the details very specifically. Now he's stained kind of bronze because of the tannic acids that were in um, the bog. And that does actually dissolve some of the enamel, enamel on the teeth. Uh, but for the most part, the organic tissues are very well preserved. What are some other ways we can tell how people looked even going further back in time? Another case of excellent preservation, this one very dry and sealed environment of King Tut's tomb. Um, Tutankhamun, uh, one of the most famous Egyptian pharaohs today, but a lesser known pharaoh at the time. He was about 19 when he died. They've done CAT scans, lots of reconstruction here. You can see a reconstruction of King Tut's face based on the mummy to the right. Uh, we can get fairly accurate artistic scientific reconstructions of faces from skulls. Uh, King Tut was killed either by a blow to the head, or it could be that he was crushed by a chariot in a riding accident, that he fell off of his chariot and was run over. He died in 1352 BCE. And one of the ways we can know how a pharaoh looks is by their sarcophagus, but because King Tut died so early, his burial chamber, his sarcophagus wasn't ready yet. So his face, facial reconstruction is actually a little different than his death mask because they probably used the death mask from somebody else um, to bury uh, King Tut quickly because his death was unexpected and premature. Similar kind of a case, here's the uh, terracotta sculpture, um, the Sianti Hunoi uh, Tijnaza from ancient Rome and Italy, artistic expression and sculptures. Um, and uh, sometimes these are made a bust of the individual. In this case, a burial sarcophagus has a, a big sculpture of the individual 
uh, noble elite woman who is buried in um, this casket below. And the question is, to what degree does the sculpture uh, depict the reality of how the individual looked? So in this case study, there was a uh, forensic artist that was given the skull of the remains and not really shown the um, sarcophagus, just given the skull and said, okay, do your facial reconstruction from the skeleton inside the sarcophagus. The age of death of this female was about 50 years old. She suffered some facial damage from a writing accident and the radiocarbon dates place the age uh, about 250 to 150 BC, so a little over two millennia old. So the question here is, does the facial uh, reconstruction match the sarcophagus? And as you can see in a comparison here, um, the artistic scientific method of facial reconstruction from a skull is fairly accurate if we assume that the sarcophagus is a um, representation of the person who is buried inside. And um, you know, it's always tough if you have to, if a, a nobleman commissions a painting or a sculpture of, of you, the artist is sort of uh, in a tough spot to make that person look as um, good as possible. So perhaps in the sarcophagus, you know, uh, the individual is missing a couple of chins there that you see in the reconstruction and so forth. So um, something in between the two may be a, a very accurate representation of how this middle-aged woman uh, appeared. She would have been fairly older age at 50 years old at that time, uh, appeared in life and at death. Now, what else can we learn from, say, ancient DNA? Uh, we want to caution against making species-wide characterizations in the use of DNA. It's difficult to really discern appearance from DNA. So, it's not like you can take somebody's DNA and then reconstruct what they look like, um, like you could with facial reconstruction from a skull. So these are experimental at best, and maybe someday we'll learn more about um, the coding for red hair and blue eyes uh, and skin pigmentation at the level of DNA, but uh, it's, it's an experimental approach at best. But one question we could ask is, did modern humans get their red hair and pale white skin from interbreeding with Neanderthals who were a European adapted species. We do know there's hybridization and admixture between the two species in Europe in particular. People of modern humans of European descent have two to 4% Neanderthal DNA in them. So to what degree did we inherit some of those Northern attributes from Neanderthals? These are questions that geneticists will be pursuing. So key concepts to summarize, we've talked about assessing the physical attributes of individuals. We've talked about how to identify the sex, the biological aspects of sex, the size and shape of skeletal traits, particularly the pelvis. Subadults are difficult to attribute sex to because of their neotenous traits. We looked at determining age at death from the bone microstructure, the osteons and the epiphyseal plate patterns and merging, the um, skull plates merging, tooth eruption sequences, and tooth ridge patterns, all very useful in determining the age at death. We looked at different scenarios, a couple of case studies. There'll be more in subsequent videos of appearance. Accurate reconstructions can be made from intact skulls through facial reconstruction. Um, some cases, preservation is so excellent, you can actually just see the individual for yourself because the soft tissue is preserved. And then relationships, um, physical attributes can help determine the degree to which people were related or their standing in social society, their social organization, were they upper class um, and so on. And if you did DNA analysis, you could compare family units um, from a cemetery sort of setting. So a quick note on the references here used in this particular video. And I thank you all for your attention.